Uh, we're in Romans chapter 2, uh, starting with verse 1. We, we've been working through uh, Romans, and we're going to continue on, but so if you have something that your devotions you'd like to do in the, the next few weeks, you can spend time in Romans, study what God has for us. And uh, we've talked about uh, the idea of, Paul talks about in chapter 1 about the fact that he's under obligation, uh, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, and to the Jews, he's under obligation to share the gospel. And then he's also, he talks about, he is eager to preach the gospel, he's excited about preaching the gospel. And the third thing says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. So Paul has given uh, these things that, are, that, he's, that he's empowering him to go forth. Really and truly, we should be... Uh, and understand that we're under obligation once we've come to know Christ to tell others that we're, uh, we should be eager to tell them and also we should be people that are not ashamed of the gospel. And sometimes that's difficult for us, but that's really what God's called us to do. And then we went on and talked about the wrath of God as it revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness. Uh, we see that since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what we have been have been made so that we are without excuse. We, we should look at the nature, not that that brings us salvation, but we should know that as we look at the nature that we are seeing God's handiwork, we should recognize that there is a God. And then we talked about also that time that man has exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image uh, in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. We've exchanged that. We've exchanged God for uh, other um, other idols. And then last week we talked about the fact that uh, that God gave them over. We talked about the fact that God gave them over. They went. They turned away from God, and God gave them over three different times in that that short passage, verse twenty-four through thirty-two. He talked about giving them over because they had become so decadent, their hearts had been so hardened that it gave them over. And, and he's building a case, he's building the case that he's going to come into chapter 3 about the fact that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So he builds that case. The next thing he's talking about here in chapter 2 is basically the moralist. The moralist is not uh, somebody that may not deny God, but they don't really have anything to do with them. It's, they, they think they're good people. Uh, you'll talk to people and say they'll say, well, you know, I never sinned. Uh, I don't really have any reason to have to know of God. Um, all kinds of excuses that they make because they don't see this fact that they have uh, our sin, that they're separated from God. And so be, uh, as he goes on now in verse 1, Therefore you are without excuse, every man of you who passes judgment, for in that you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you judge, for you judge, practice the same things. You who judge practice the same thing. He says, first of all, you're without excuse. You're without excuse. Because every man who passes judgment, in other words, if a person puts judgment on another person, uh, for in that you judge others, you condemn yourself. For you judge practice, you judge practice the same things. So when he, we judge people about what we're already doing them ourselves. We're, we're without sin. He's, he's talking about the persons that you encounter. Tom talks about the fellow playing pool. He encounters that person. You, you'll encounter other people that as you go about your life, if you talk about Jesus, they'll say, I didn't have, I've never killed anybody. I've never done the great big sins. They don't understand that being uh, unholy is a sin in God's eyes. And so then he says, and we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. The judgment of God is going to fall upon the people that practice the things of, of being not living out their life for God. And they, they accuse other people, of, and they're wrong, but they're doing the same things. He goes on in verse 3, And do you suppose this, O man, when you pass judgment upon those who practice such things and do the same thing yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? He's saying that you think you're going to be able to judge others, judge others, and then you do the same thing, you're going to get away with it. And, and he says that to try to make it clear to those people, to those people that they're, they're out of line, 
in their, in their life? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kingdom and forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads to your uh, leads you to repentance? That, that's an interesting verse. Um, I think uh, that's something in the, uh, that we need to really think about and understand because do you think lightly, do people think lightly of the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience? Do, do they think, I mean, many of us, if God, uh, before we came to know Christ, we could have easily been struck down and we would have been guilty. And that's what happens, people do that. But he, his kindness, his forbearance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. God's kindness to us, even though oftentimes we know what we were doing was wrong, we know that sort of thing, we tell we, we do those things that are wrong, but God's kindness, His love, He's never give up on us. He never gave up on us. His kindness leads us to repentance. His kindness leads us to repentance. What an amazing thought that is to understand that God's kindness. People look at God as a, and He is going to judge the world. He's going to judge the unsaved. But he, he, His kindness continues on because He hasn't wiped us all out. He's kind because he's, he still cares for us. He still wants us to come to know the saving grace of Jesus. So it's the, the kindness of God leads you to repentance. Uh, then, but in verse 5, but because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. So it's, you're storing up wrath that you're going to experience when the, when the end time comes, when God calls. It's going to be your wrath that's going to receive the, the judgment of God. We, we want to blame God for all our stuff. The truth of the matter is, it's our own, uh, it's our own life that is a problem. I, I, was, I may have said this before, but over the last year or so, I sort of realized... Um, I always thought when I was a young guy growing up, and even as I got older, that that uh, the world was just waiting for me to conquer it. I'm to go conquer the world. Uh, and then, you know, the last year or so, I realized, uh, you know what the bigger problem is? Is not conquering the world. The bigger problem is conquering Tom. That he lives in the world in such a way that God is glorified. Surrendering, letting God conquer, really, and surrendering because we we the stuff that we do to conquer the world usually isn't really all that productive. I don't know about you, but that's what I found. And and it says God's going to render judgment. Uh, will render to every man according to his deeds. And then in verse seven, to those who who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and own, and own immortality and eternal life, but to those who are selfishly am, ambitious. And do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory and honor and peace to every man who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no impartiality with God. He's saying that you're going to be people that do good. That this is not how you get saved. This is a result of your salvation that you're going to be perseverance in doing good. Seek the glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. We come to know Christ and we begin to live our life out in that way. It's not that we that we work hard, we do all those things, that's what gets us to heaven. It's our relationship with Jesus Christ that gets us into heaven. And as a result of that relationship, we want to do the things that God has laid before us. Before us. He wants we want to be uh, do good, seek glory and honor and immortality and eternal life. And but to those who are selfishly ambitious. And do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indicate indignation. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But the glory and honor and peace to every man who does good to the Jew first and to also the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. A couple things happen here. First of all, the Jews think they're above the Gentiles. They think they're above the Gentiles. Paul's trying to explain to them, even though you try to keep the law, you do all that stuff, that, that won't do 
that won't do you ultimately any good. But if you come to know Christ and you work through those things, but the Christ is available to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So he's available to all. We, we have a responsibility uh, because God is not partial to one or another. If we're going to reach out to the world, we sometimes people think that one race is greater than another race, or one person, one uh, uh, personality type person is different than better than the others. But with God, there's no partiality. God sees you as who you are. He sees you either as a lost soul, soul or a saved soul. And either way, He's always reaching out to you. But we, what we have to do, what you and I need to do, or the people we deal with, is to share with them the reality that they are not, they're, that they're sinners and that they're not going to be able to work their way, pay their way, or any other way to get to heaven other than through faith. And so we, we're about that business of, of, uh, of sharing with other people. And then verse 12, For all who have sinned without the law will perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. So he says, if you're not under the law, if you're a Gentile, you, you will be judged. If you're under the law, you'll be judged because you didn't keep the law, but both will be judged. There's not, you can't, you're not uh, doing good stuff that's going to keep you from being judged. And then, for not the hearers of the law, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Because you've heard the law, because you, they, in that case, if they thought they were living under the law, that they would be justified, but it's because we do the law, because we live the law, again, we can't live it out unless we know Christ as our Savior. And that's what he's going to, that's what he's working uh, towards in his parts to realize that whether you're Jew or whether you're Gentile, you're guilty of sin. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves. They, and then that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternating, accusing, or else defending them. On, that day, on the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. So if you're not under the law, if you're a Gentile, and you live by your conscience, there's going to be good things that come out of that. But that's not salvation, that's living out the good things. And if you're under the law and you do some good things, that's not salvation, because ultimately the salvation is in a relationship with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And Paul's trying to, he's building that case. He's building the case, ultimately, that all have sinned. There's no way that you can get around it. Whether you're under the law or whether you're not under the law, you're a sinner. And, and next week we're going to see uh, the condemnation of the Jews. He's going to talk about the fact that they, they did not, they did not follow the law. And the reality is they could not, they could not follow the law. Because of our human nature, we could not. There's only one who's fulfilled the law. That's Christ Jesus. We didn't do away with the law when Christ came. The law is a guide that we see of how we should live our life. It's a guide to live the way we should in the midst of our, of wherever it is that we're placed. But we live by grace. We live because of Christ's righteousness in us. And so this is the great challenge. It's the great challenge, uh, it's a great challenge to, to each of us, but it's also a great challenge to the world as we take the gospel, as we take the gospel to a, a society that is already thinking that they're really great. It's one of the interesting things, I was one of the guys that was uh, uh, over there at the, at the conference, he's a, he's a, a Haitian guy, and uh, I talked to him a bit because I used to go to Haiti quite a bit, and, and he'd been in the same spots, right in the same spots kind of where he grew up, but I asked him about uh, Don and Winnie Weaver, They've been here, I, some of you may or may not remember, but Don and Winnie Weaver were uh, missionaries in Haiti for 50 uh, plus years, 51 I think. And they, they tried to leave Haiti once before God stopped them, they went back. This time, when they left Haiti, they came to the villages and bought a home. They bought a home down south of Waves. And the day that they, as they were signing, as they were signing the contract to have a house in the villages, the earthquake and destroyed their house in the mountain in Haiti. And when he said, I think that was a sign that it was right for us to leave. The only bad part of that was that their daughter was in the house 
the day that the earthquake hit. She got protected. She was in the back and Brooke destroyed a lot of stuff there, but she was protected and saved. But she said, I believe that God suggests it's time for you to leave. But I say that to you because I, said, I spoke to the, the, the fellow, the, that's the Haitian guy that works in South Florida. I said, I told him about the Weavers and I said that their ministry was to the government officials, the upper uh, echelon of Haitian society. Um, there's only two classes in Haiti, the very wealthy and the very poor. There's really nothing in between, maybe a merchant or two, but not very little. And he said to me, that's, one of, that's the hardest ministry in Haiti, is to reach the people in the upper echelon because they've already got everything. They don't need anything else. They don't want anything else. And, he's, and, and the people, the poor, the, the poor they, they, they respond not so, much, not so for, the, for money, but for hope, hope of a better life, hope of eternity. And so I say this to you because when we deal with people, when we minister to people, when we offer the gospel to people in our culture, many of them, maybe they aren't as rich as the Haitian leaders, but many of the people are very comfortable in their lives. And they don't want to be disrupted. They don't want to be disrupted by this God stuff. What do you mean i got to go to Africa? Do you mean I have to sell all my stuff? Do I have to do this? Do I, and the Bible doesn't say anything about that. The Bible says you need to trust Jesus as your Savior, and as you do that, He will begin to transform your life. Now, one day down the road you may sell all your stuff, but the truth of the matter is, you ain't taking it home. You're not go, it's not going anyplace, you're just going to have it for your kids to fight over. Why not give it away to somebody? This, this is the challenge. When, when, we, when we want peace, we think we, some people go out and have a smoke or they have a drink or they have... When we want peace, we go to Christ. Christ is in us. In Christ. We're in Christ. We, we get our peace from our relationship with Him. I, I just think that, that we need to be about the business of living out our life on a day-by-day -day basis in the places that we go. And we're going to encounter people that say they have no reason no reason to know God. Everything's cool. And how can you know God anyway? Well, you know God because we see around us what, what, there's no way that we can do that. I, I tried to make a tree. I haven't, I've been trying that for years. Never have made a tree. How about you? Have you ever made a tree? I, I used to practice. We used to have a pool back in the olden days. And I used to practice walking on water. Did you ever practice that? I only ever got like halfway across the pool before I saw but, you know, listen, we're, we can't do the stuff God does, and it's all around us. And the other thing that we have is we have the Bible. We have the Word of God. For the, for, we have the Word of God that, that we know that if we, once we know, come to know Christ, He reveals that the author of the book lives within us, the Holy Spirit. What, what a marvelous God we serve. What a marvelous opportunity we have to take the, the message of Christ to the world. Not because we're better than them, not because we've got more knowledge than them, because we have great pain and we have great compassion for them to not spend eternity in hell. And if we don't believe in hell, then you can just march on. But the truth is that the Bible says that there's hell and that we're separated for eternity from God. We, we have a mission and a message that can change people's lives. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we're able to gather, to share with one another, encourage one another. We just thank you for the tremendous blessings that you've given us. Sometimes we get so uh, wrapped up in our lives that we forget to, to think about what you've done for us, to think about you even. And, and Father, we want to be men and women that put you first in our lives. That we, we that you, we flow out of you, we flow out of your your love, we flow out of your word, and we live that out as we go about the things that we do. Because you've given us, you've given us not only Jesus, but you've inhabited us with the Holy Spirit, who guides us and leads us if we will allow. So we thank you, we praise you, and we honor you. In Jesus' holy name, amen. We're going to stand and sing together. Uh, my life is in you. My life is in you. You're in Christ. Oh,
blood is in the hue of my strength, is in the hue of my strength.